last few times about the various levels of Seichel. And we um, elaborated a little more last week on on the contrast of say of Seichel Bahami and Seichel Anushi. As we pointed out that Seichel Bahami is is in the person and Seichel Anushi is in the person. In the individual human being there are these two levels of Seichel. And um, today, I would like to pursue this and go a little further and elaborate on actually to be able to understand and identify Seichel and Nushi. As we pointed out, that Seichel and Nushi is imperative to be able to go understand Torah, to be able to reach up to the higher Seichel, which is Seichel and Aki. Enushi means human. Enosh comes from the word enosh, human being. Before I go into this, I want to clarify again the word seichel. Seichel means intelligence, as we normally translate it. But since that, in the, in the secular world, we have been accustomed to, re- to re- refer to intelligence as something that is not even in the category of Seichel altogether. So this is why I want to first identify Seichel for what it is. We commonly relate, refer to Seichel as a means to figure things out. I'm going to go briefly into this, because we already touched upon this previously, which means Seichel is essentially a means to an end. I want to get someplace, and I'm using my Seichel to figure out how to get there. Their Seichel is merely a tool in satisfying some other quest that I have. This is not what is meant by the word Seichel in Chesidus, in Torah. The human being has a neshama, has a soul. What that means is that he is not just a body that is able to move around and act, and then he can train his body to do various things, or a brain that is able to just think, and he can train his his brain to think and figure things out. Right in the beginning, at birth, he has a neshama. And neshama means that a human being has a perception immediately of what world is, what his existence is, and what life is about. He has a perception because his neshama knows it. 
he doesn't necessarily have it consciously. He cannot elaborate on it. But he innately has that knowledge. And this becomes evident, as we already mentioned, when we observe the fact that we have a person looking, searching for something. And when he finds it, he identifies it immediately and says, this is what I was looking for. How did he know what to look for to begin with? And how does he identify that which he found? It is that he inherently knew what he is looking for. Because that's what a human being is. He has a perception of what truth is. And then he is looking for the place and the means by which he can express that truth in his practical life. How do you live according to that truth? So Seichel is in effect a true expression of what the human being is, what his soul is. And in that, there are two levels. There is the human level and there is the godly level in the human being. The godly level is, hopefully we'll get to, we'll be able to discuss it, but this is not for now yet. But the human level we have to discuss because this is something which we all can readily understand and we all can appreciate its power. And if we begin to engage and use it, we will see how, how to what heights and it can bring us. <coughs> we'll start from bottom up. Everyone knows from childhood, whatever his background is, that he has to keep himself clean, he has to wash up in the morning. seems to be a very simple, very simple concept. But how we relate to it, how we understand it, becomes significant. We can relate to it as we have to be clean so that we don't soil our food, so that we don't soil um, uh, things that we touch so that we don't have unpleasant unpleasant orders and we can be uh, pleasant uh, with other people, so that we feel comfortable. All of these things are very valid. These are all things, reasons for for cleanliness. But who needs a reason for cleanliness? When is a reason for cleanliness necessary? When cleanliness per se is not appreciated. When cleanliness is something which is an add-on, which means I can really live without it. <clears throat> Lahavdal, the horse, the dog, they don't care. They care only if, if bugs begin to bother them. But otherwise, 
cleanliness doesn't mean anything. So to them, you have to have a reason. Why, why wash up? A human being is of a higher caliber. He has a perception of things, simple things, but that these simple things have a true value of their own. It is not just because of the result, the positive or negative result in its absence, but because this is the way a human being is. By extension, this incorporates and affects every aspect of a person's life. His cupboards, his, his possessions are neatly put away. His, his, his objects are, are safeguarded properly don't fly all over the place. This is because he's a human being. And we know from experience, everyone can experience that, that the minute we are neglectful on any of these simple aspects, we lose a certain standing, we lose a certain standard in our own personal thinking. If it's okay that my room is is a shambles and things are flying all over the place, all I need this room is is a place where I can put my head down and sleep. And when I sleep, I don't know what's going on around, around me anyway. So this seems to be a logical argument. It's a logical argument for the behemoth in the human being, not for the human being in the human being. And this itself can pull a person down. It disturbs his mood, it disturbs his, what's commonly called self-respect, and he loses sense of, of himself, of his own life. So then he turns around and says, oh no, I have to do this, I have to do this. And then it becomes like a burden, it's like a job, like an, an, a responsibility to do. But he does not realize that it is his very person, it's not an external demand, it's his very person that demands it. His very soul, the human soul, that supplies the, the force to do it. He does not need justification. This is the crux and, of, of, uh, and extremely important to understand, that there's a certain basic standards in human life that do not need logical justification. They are simply expressions of the fact that this is a human being. Once we engage the human quality and we recognize that there is this human force in us, then we open our mind to be able to comprehend and relate to thoughts, to ideas that we never dreamt we would be able to understand. Because these are ideas that we can on, that are only true if you look at things from a much higher perspective, 
But if you look at things from a practical, from a worldly, from a gashus like perspective, these things seem to be seem to be imaginary. Once the world, um, the, the the world acquires a certain reality to the person. The reality means that there is order in the world. It is not just a whole bunch of things that accidentally work in a certain way. Then we are able to perceive and to relate to things that I said before that we would never imagine we'd be able to, to recognize. And then that leads, that opens us up to be able to understand godly concepts, Torah concepts. Otherwise, we learn Torah, and even the logic of Torah, we are understanding it from a behemoth perspective. For instance, two people have a dispute. And they come to the best deal. And they argue, they present their arguments. And the best deal comes to a conclusion and presents the reasons for their conclusion and says, Ruven, you have to do thus, Shimon, you have to do thus. We perceive it only from the from the perspective, from the view that Ruven beat Shimon. Ruven won the argument. He convinced the best. Whereas in Torah, as we will see, that's not at, at all what happened. What happened was that it is, as the Alter Rebbe explains, that there is a, a divine will that decides, that defines that this situation should result thusly. But we can't even begin to think on those terms because we don't perceive these things as real. This is just a fight between two people, whoever is stronger wins. Let me illustrate to you to what heights and what extent Simple seichel and nushi, human seichel, can lead a person. Some of these things we touched briefly before, but I want to clearly, clearly identify them. Once one recognizes that there are human values, in his own life, then when he is further exposed to a to a broader aspect. Let us say, as we discussed one time, if he is visiting a friend, is visiting a family, <coughs> a home, and in this home 
It's a home set up with furnishings, with tables and chairs. There too, this quality comes into play. He comes into this home as a guest for a meal. He's going to be eating his meal here. So, he could enter this home and ask, where is my chair, where am I going to sit, and where is my food? Because actually that's what he came for. Or he can come in and recognize that this is going to be, that this is a family and he is going to be part of this family. And thus his, his presence there is not just for the meal, but to be part of the family. To participate in the in the total goings on. This may seem quite obvious and simple, but we have to examine ourselves and see to what extent we are really experiencing this and living with this. Whether, what is the center, the central occurrence here? Is the central occurrence here the meal or the central occurrence here the participation in, in, in the goings on? To expand further on that, when we look at the whole world, and each one of us is part of this world, what happens when when the sun rises. It could be that the sun rises, which means it's daytime, and now the sun is disturbing my sleep. I live in my own little thing, my own, my own schedule, my own world. I want to sleep, but the sun has risen, and day has come, and is disturbing my sleep. Or, as we are directed in the time, we recognize that we are part of this world, and when the sun rises, along with the world waking up, I too wake up. I'm part of this, of this, of what's going on. The trees wake up when the sun rises. The birds wake up when the sun rises. And I wake up when the sun rises. I'm a participant. I recognize that there is something really great going on. I'm not just existing in my own, in my own, in, in isolated world, and the world around me is just either supporting me or it's disturbing me. Now imagine where that leads 
when one recognizes that when the sun rises, this pertains to me, this is a message to me, I'm part of it. And if the sun is telling me it's time for you to get up, this means that there is order in the world. And I am part of that water. When one begins to recognize that there is order in the world, he begins to recognize and to relate to the concept of the world being a creation. And this is still just from Seichel Lushin, just from human Seichel. It becomes perfectly reasonable to him to say that since there is such a big, beautiful world and that everything is so well organized, with day and night, monthly cycles, yearly cycles, then this could not be an accidental organization. This has to be something meaningful. Without sensing that there is meaning in the world, one cannot sense that there is a creator to the world. One can believe in it, he can learn it, he can know it, but he cannot relate to it. then even if he recognizes and believes, yes, there has to be a creator, a salt of the Torah. He didn't, where else does everything come from? But that itself becomes a burden. That itself is just superimposed upon his world. It's not a reality. It's not part of the reality in which he lives. On the other hand, if we do develop our, our human intelligence, human intelligence means we look at things not like a bird but like a human being. And we appreciate values, we appreciate what we see, we appreciate the order. And the only way to appreciate the, the order really is participate in the order. Then this opens our minds to be able to relate to the deepest principles of Yiddishkeit. The important thing to recognize while attempting and going in that direction is that these concepts are entirely human, which means that these are not concepts that I have to comply with. I have to 
learn them because this looks right, it looks good. But in fact, this is what a human being is. This is where the human happiness and unhappiness are coming from and dependent on. He will be unhappy when he is not utilizing his human qualities. And he doesn't know where this unhappiness comes from. And he can be doing everything right, but he doesn't really relate to it, because it's all a burden. <coughs> On the other hand, if he does recognize that this is perfectly human, this is not idealistic, he is not doing something great, something that must be done, he is simply developing his human skills. Developing one's human skills is infinitely more important than developing one's mathematical skills or whatever. It is to open up one's mind, open up one's heart, Not to go beyond, to open up to some, to some ruchnis de kinyani, but simply to perceive gashmius, to perceive the world, the way a human being is meant to perceive it. The strength for this is contained right there in the in the individual. As we pointed out, if he follows through, if he utilizes this and he develops it, he finds happiness, immediate. If he does not, he becomes despondent, he becomes depressed, and he's totally unhappy. And then he starts searching, why am I depressed, why am I unhappy? How can you confine a human being to live in an animal world? When the perception is that things are haphazard, things have no meaning, except I have to live according to meaning. I have to make the schedule. I have to follow order. So then it becomes a burden. But if we, if we allow for the true perception, the true concept that we have, to be, to be in focus, then everything begins to fall into place. And where do we once one start? Because of of the of the current world mentality, the current world world mentality which we are all exposed to, everybody does what they want. A child is not is not trained, is not shown right from wrong, because there's no such thing as right and wrong. So we have to do it on our own. 
we have to start from the very basics. We have to start from the very basics. We have to create an order in our day, and the order of the, of the day has to be according to the natural order. Night is for sleeping, day is for working. That's what it says in, in the Pesach. That when the sun rises, Yetzi Odom Lefolei, that's when the person rises. We have to treat our possessions with respect. We have to treat ourselves with respect. Not respect in some kind of external thing, in sense but simply as a human being. And this becomes a vehicle. This, become, this is the first step to really being able to relate to a Torah concept. Because then the Torah concept finds its place. It exists in a reality. If there are there are Torah rules, if we say a pitoira, there are six days, and the seventh day is Shabbos. Seventh day is Shabbos. You can explain that to a human being, meaning you can explain that to one who sees that there is order in the world, and to one who lives, who experiences that order then you can accept the concept that there is actually a cycle of seven days and the seven days a day of rest is Shabbos. Very simple levels. But if one does not perceive, does not live with any order, one minute pushes the other, one hour pushes the other, one day pushes the other, then he doesn't see what what, what that means. What, what is the seventh day have to do? What is the seventh day different than the sixth or the, or, the, or, the, or the eighth? And this is the principle that, we, that it says in the Torah that Derech Eretz we mentioned it recently. Derech Eretz, Kod What does Derech Eretz mean? Derech Eretz means the way of the world. And that precedes Torah. Why is Derech Eretz, Kod Why is it preceded? Not because it is greater and more important, but because this is the key. This is the means by which a human being can relate to, can come to Torah. And understand it and relate to it. Not just he should be forced upon him. And he is, has to do it because, because he's afraid to be punished. But because he can relate to it. I'm sorry? So here, Kodma means precede, it's prerequisite, you're saying? Kodma means precede, it precedes because it's a prerequisite. And we should reflect on the, on the gift of the special blessing that Hashem had given us. When we talk about godly things, you say godly things in this world are, are out of the world. How can, how can I understand it? But simple human things, these are natural things. These are things that I can readily relate to. I have to get into the proper habit. I have to practice it properly. But I can readily 
not to really relate. I can understand. I can readily see that a human being is different than a an animal. And I have all kinds of illustrations. I can perceive it. I can understand it with my simple say that a human being is different than an animal. And having that gift, natural gift, that we can see this. We can more, much more easily practice it, much more easily imbue it into our, um, into our habit. And thereby uplift ourselves to the point where we can begin to understand Torah in the true sense. That when it says in the Torah, Bereish is bore lekim rashomayim was ha'oretz, that God created the heavens and the earth, it makes sense. Because before we even learned it, I already perceived that this is not a haphazard world. This is a real world with order. And I was looking to know where it's coming from because it has to have come from someplace. Somebody must have, must have done it with tremendous wisdom. I already knew it before I even opened the first, the first verse in the Prosik. But if I don't have that background, and all of a sudden I learn, where is this coming from? I have no indication, I have no evidence at all that it was created. Where is, where is God coming to my life? I don't see the world as a creation. It's just there. So this simple approach, this simple practice, sounds like almost like going to Heder, you know, going to Heder, going to first grade. But yes, we all have to go to first grade. And you have to go to, we have to put ourselves to first and second and third grade. If we find some something missing, we have to apply ourselves to it. Because otherwise whatever we learn is just sticking to our to to our externals. It's just not permeating. It doesn't it doesn't find a place in our minds. It's not real. And no matter how much I believe in it, it's not real. There is a perfect dichotomy. I believe in this, but I see the, uh, the world uh, totally differently. And I'm constantly being torn away, torn up on it. So, when Hashem gave us a Torah, He gave us all the means by which we can not only learn Torah, but by which we can accept it, we can relate to it, we can feel comfortable with it, we can feel elated by it, we can feel elevated by it, we can fully absorb it. It's all a gift to us. If we come to a verse in the Torah and we see it just doesn't stick, we have to begin, we have to reflect where in my perception of reality am I, or am I missing? And if I would only apply myself to it and see that really my perception of reality is, is incorrect even from my own perspective. In other words, really I myself as a human being should see it differently. I do see it differently. There's one problem which I want to attend to before we finish.
and that is a sense of cynicism. The minute we start thinking in true human terms, even in the sense that we have described, I see an orderly world. And the next step is, of course, if it's an orderly world, there has to be a creator for it. There's immediately an, an, a, an attack from, from the left side and says, hey, you're dreaming, you're imagining. You see it, but you see it, but, but it's not a reality. The world is just the world. You happen to see it this way. Somebody else sees it differently. It's the way you want to see it, that's the way you see it. This is called the cynicism that comes from, from the left side, that comes from the behemoth, that does not want order that wants that wants a have care free for all doesn't want to go in any kind of of discipline i want to do what i want to do whenever i want to do as a matter of fact if i don't want to do anything it's also okay that's the pain and then when we face when we imagine, we face the world at large, and we have all the comments coming from outside of the world, of the outside world, then there is no limit to the cynicism. And this is where we have to focus in and look at the reality. Is there a human being or there is not? Are we human or are we not? It's a very simple question. This is not a godly concept. This is not something super world. This is simply the, the world has four categories in creation. There's the domain. The domain means the inanimate objects, the stone and the rocks. There is the tzemeach. There is the plant world, that which grows, which has an, a signs of life. There is the chai. There's the animal world. Then there is the medaber, that is the human being. Is the human being a true denomination all on its own, independent of all the others, on a category by itself, that perceives the world in its own way, quite different than every, anything else? Quite different than anything else? And is it justified for the human being to see the world differently than the heart of the animal? This requires certain conviction, certain strength. <coughs> not to be dragged down, not to be to be not to allow the human quality in us to be drowned away. This is the simple principle of standing up for what you are. The first principle is to know I'm a human being. Which means I do not bend down to my food as we saw the other day. I bring the food up to my mouth. In every action, in everything that I do, I am different than an animal. In every action that I do is different, and every perception that I have is different. And this is natural, this is the way, this is the reality as I see it. it Nobody is going to convince me of any other reality. If I see order in the world, then there is order in the world. Absolutely. 
I don't need any proof. I don't need any arguments about it. This is the way the reality is perceived by the human being. Only into this reality can you bring Torah in. And then the Torah find it has a place. Everything makes sense. It can relate to everything. So in closing, having exposed and explained what it is, the most important message, the most important principle that I want to convey is that each one of us is a full-fledged human being. We really have that koyak, we really have that perception. We don't have to open a book, any book, to learn it. This is the way we see the world. And this is the world into which we enter, and, the, and this is the world to which we apply whatever we learn. That's the, our reality. It takes some strength to stand up to it. But, this, but what are we standing up to? We're standing up to the principle that we are not animals. Would anyone accept the title of animal readily, willingly? We have to know that we live in the world and each one of us was exposed to ideas that are completely, completely perverted and sick. Human beings are not animals. It's a category all unto itself. That before even, as I said, before even opening the first verse in the Torah, sees the world differently. We have to stand up to this. We have to come, come to, to learning, come to davening, come to eating with this with, with this approach, with this principle, who we are. And then we will see that things begin to make sense and we understand things totally differently. And it's no special effort to put things in order, whether it is in my room or it's in my table where I eat or whatever it is. It's no special effort. Because that's, that's the way it is. That's the way I am. I'm not living in a stall. I'm living, I'm, I'm a human being. By nature, this is the way, by nature, by the nature of his intelligence, this is the way he lives. If we reflect on, on the principles of Seichel and Nushi, then we can begin to think in terms of what is meant by a seichel aleki. Aleki, by a godly seichel, which is in the category all unto itself. But if we do not go through this step, we will be thinking, we will be learning Torah with the eyes of a cat, <laughs> learning seichel aleki with the eyes of a cat, and it will all fall into the same, in the same bag. all make the same sense. So this is the Nakuda. If you guys reflect on it, think about it. If you have any questions, Mitzvah Shem, I will try to attend to them. It's in, this is Manu's the principle. We can't start from without this understanding. We've come here to learn Torah, but before we can begin to learn Torah, we have to wash away 
the perversions and the misconceptions, misrepresentations with which we came. We all came here because we we had a sense, like we said, we searched for the truth and we, we really had a sense that we were looking for something. But that's the neshama. But when it comes practically, when it comes to, to putting it into perspective and putting it into seichel and living with it, then we have to really develop an approach, understand how do we approach this whole thing. So have a good evening.